So um, I've been doing content strategy since 1999, which is a really long time. And the content part has changed a lot, and it's gotten a lot better. The people part is the, is the part that's tricky. So uh, let me just turn around the computer. Well, I may have to come back, read my notes, or whatever. But let's just start. So here's, this is the middle. You walk into the CEO's office, and you say, um, that over the past few years, our digital channel has become the main way that we interact with our customers. And we're not using it as well as we can. We say that we want to have a long-term relationship with loyal customers, but no one can find our information. Nobody can use it. We're not publishing it in a way that it's really resonating. And I have a plan and I have a vision about how to make that happen. And it's going to require new ways of working together. And I want to walk you through that plan and get your buy-in. That's the middle. That's the where you start to sort of bring things together that you've laid in place before. And then you're able to get that buy-in, get that approval, and move forward and make this happen and create these new ways of working. So let me just ask you a question. Could you have that conversation today? Is there anyone here who could have that conversation with the CEO today? Yeah. Sure. You could? Yeah. You have You have the stories to tell about what's working? Good. Absolutely. Terrific. We'll talk about it later. Absolutely. I'd love to. So um, this is uh, Stefan Linder, and he is the CEO of uh, Tag Heuer Watches. So here's some common challenges. Oh, here's a story. The other day, Monday, I had a conversation with somebody from a big software company. And he is in the HR division and responsible for the online customer experience of the HR content on that intranet that they have. And he said he wants to create a repository for all the HR content that um, uh, is about benefits and payroll and all that stuff that can be available to any employee through any device. And, um, and I asked him who owns the corporate intranet, and he said, well, communications own them, owns it, and they set up SharePoint, but we don't like it. And we don't like it because they've set up you know, just a few templates, and it really doesn't let us be creative enough and be innovative enough. And, um, and in fact, because our content owners within HR dislike SharePoint so much, they've kind of stopped taking down anything they've ever put up, and they, they're not behaving well. So I want to fix this by creating a new platform. Again, good idea, not a good idea. Which one, did, what do you think? If this is a small group, and I really hope that this is an interactive session. So what do you think? Why, Rachel? And neither do extra websites. So I think the whole going rogue thing, because we don't like the other platform and we don't like what the other people tell us, that perpetuates the problem and it really makes it worse. And so his vision is, is a great vision, but he's sort of in the wrong spot within the organization to be executing this vision because then, then there's multiple vision, uh, visions if every department or division wants to go do the same thing. So here's some other issues that I've really seen. So tell me if you've had these problems. Um, one, no one can find anything on our website, so they're complaining to the CEO. Sound familiar? Here's another one. We, um, uh, everyone, practically everybody and their brother in our organization publishes content online, and you'd never know it was from the same organization in terms of what it sounds like. That's a common one that I see. Um, Nobody owns the home page. Or worse, everyone owns the home page. Um, sometimes our, our website is created based on our organizational structure, which isn't a content strategy problem per se, but it's certainly a, a problem and an issue that affects content greatly. Um, we publish things as PDFs with file names like 4002.pdf, which is, so these are things I see all the time. And another one, what was the other one I had? Um, hold on. Uh, we can't pull in related links automatically because our content's not tagged. We, um, 
People can get their, they can't get our information on their mobile device. We don't think we're on Google as much, much as we should be. Or, you know, or somebody said, the, uh, the volunteer leader of the year said, we should be on YouTube, or we should be on Pinterest, or we should be on in Instagram. So these are all things that greatly affect content strategy like crazy. Um, here's some more. We use language jargon. We don't know what to put on the homepage first or what to put on Facebook. We've never, we, everything we've ever published is still online, which I call content hoarding. Um, new content's missing or it's different on different channels. So these are content issues, but they really have business consequences. So if you don't solve your problems, your content problems and your people problems, your website is gonna ultimately turn into a ghost town. And they're about process and ownership and collaboration and all these other things that make the content itself work. So sometimes it feels like this, and I hope this works. Hold on. Nope. I don't know, not playing. Okay, so doesn't work. Let's just say sometimes managing web content feels like herding cats. So this was a hysterical one minute commercial all about being a cat herder. I understand that in Germany they usually call it herding fleas, but you understand the same idea. <laughs> what? Nobody? You don't understand? I don't understand. Oh, good. Um, so here's something. Content can't do its job if people get in the way. So this is why we're having this conversation. Here's a great quote from a guy named Paul Ford who spoke at Confab in Minneapolis in the US uh, a couple years ago. And he said, every pixel has an owner. So this is the question. Why are people getting in the way of their content? And why does this have to involve a conversation with the CEO? And it's, I think, because of how people are how people's jobs are structured and how divisions are structured. And ultimately, this isn't um, a problem that was created by the person who has that job, really, because they were given the job to do. And it's not really a problem that a content strategist can fix alone. And this was a really important lesson that I learned when I was website director for a large national association in the United States. And I was in charge of making sure that our website did all those things. I all addressed all those challenges that I listed before. And I couldn't do it by myself. I tried and tried and tried and tried for five and a half years. And I thought I had crossed the bridge. And I thought I had buy-in from the CEO. And then the next second, I didn't. It was sort of slippery buy-in. And I think that the moving it up the chain step by step and really getting that buy-in and getting to use that buy-in and have it stick is the way to go. Because the, um, and ultimately it means changing the way people's performance is measured. Other things that have nothing to do with content and changing the way that the um, programs are budgeted. Because if, if the website is a program budgeted off to the side, then everybody else who has a different program that's, funded differently within your organization, they're not going to be seeing eye to eye and not going to really be motivated to work together. And I think that this is a huge reason why we have always done it that way. So in big organizations that have been around for a long time, this is sort of this unspoken mantra, and it's kind of challenging. So here's what I think is the formula for content success the right people in the right roles, having a shared understanding of the audience, good governance, which is really the power to say no, um, having your voice and tone, editorial guidelines, and that kind of thing all, all nailed down very solid. And that's the part where content strategists already know how to do that. Um, having an editorial calendar and creating measurable goals. And so I think that there are five steps to transcending politics. One, create the strong foundation, which is all those things I talked about before. Two, have a pilot or several so that you're testing and learning, are the policies right? Are the rules correct? Are, is the content strategy Bible that you've created, is it working? 
um, and figure out if it's not working, how to tweak that. And then you're ready to sell the vision and have that conversation with the CEO. And then you start to, to launch it and you have to build the, cu the culture change that's involved with that. And that's a slow and steady process because it didn't start overnight and it's not gonna be fixed overnight either. Then you practice and evolve and make it grow. And how about that? I hate when these things don't work. Hello, did that work? There it is. So I think that first you have to establish your roots. So this is an actual diagram of a plant growing. So before you've launched, before you launch everything, so this is launch and, and evolve and make it grow, you have to make sure that the foundation is placed. You have to make, is in place. You have to make sure that those roots are firm and they're growing first. But, and that's why I didn't start with like, oh, just launch something. You have a lot of homework to do before you have something to launch. And it's got to be tested and sort of that's it. Like put your little feelers out there and figure out whether Instagram is the right place for us to do it. Whether all of our PDFs really need to be web pages or whether it's okay. Whether, um, you know, how, m how much of a focus do you put on mobile all the time? So I wanted to take a step back. And like Margot said about definitions, this is my definition of content strategy. So it has three parts. The first part is this foundation. It's, it's identifying and articulating all these things. Who, what, when, where, why, and how of publishing and managing content. Who's, who's publishing information in your organization? And who are they publishing it for? Back in the day, I, I started working long before there was the internet. So back in the day, you know, every department created a set of brochures and they handed it to the audience that they wanted to give it to. So the who, both on the creator side and the consumer side, it was clear and it was really controllable. Well, then the internet came along and all of a sudden it wasn't clear or controllable anymore because everybody's brochure lived next to each other and it all sort of surfaces on the homepage. So if you describe our organization one way and you describe our organization another way, now the customer's confused. So the confusion wasn't nearly as obvious before. So it's figuring out all of those, where are we putting the content, how often, all of those details. Then this is literally a strategic statement tying content to business and user needs. So I think that, and I'll talk about this more in a second, the word content is a funny and sort of misused word or misunderstood word. And, um, but ultimately, your company, your organization needs to have a statement created by the people who work there, not just you by yourself, that says, we will use content to meet our business goals and help our users meet their goals. And what does that look like for us? Describing that. So it's sort of a, a strategic content statement. And this is the other part that's usually missing from most content strategy definitions that I see, you need the people, processes, and power to actually carry out that statement. Because if you have, this is what happened to me. I had all the rules, I s and, and I have a picture of it in a couple slides. We spent a long time and a lot of money creating all the rules. We did not have we, the second piece, really, and we certainly didn't have the third piece, which is why it didn't work. So I see content strategist as an orchestra conductor. So of the, all the material that comes out of the organization, and when I say material, I don't mean the extraneous communications, I mean the actual stuff. So just like in an orchestra, and I love the metaphor as I uh, overdo them in analogy sometimes, and I apologize for that, but I think this one's good. Um, just like in an orchestra, there's a tuba and a violin and the drums, all of those things alone are beautiful, they're fine, and flute and all that, but together they can either make really beautiful music or they can make a complete cacophony. And I feel like often we're, our organizations are in the second boat, and so uh, content strategists can play a really important role in helping orchestrate all that so it sounds good. This is actually my logo, and it's how I described what I do to the designer I was working with. So I'm not showing it to you because I'm stuck up, I'm showing it to you because it really is good. So this is the, the, so content is a terrible word. 
nobody in any of our organizations says that they're a content creator or a content owner. We call them that. And one of the ways that I learned about this at the National Association of Realtors where I worked is that we used to have quarterly meetings with them and we called them information managers. And of course we abbreviated because we abbreviate everything and I think we all do this. So we called them IM meetings. That was what we, on our team. And we would send out meeting invitations, IM meeting, quarterly, whatever. And then I realized like they don't call themselves that. We're, we're um, having the same problem that we accuse them of, of using our own jargon. And I think content strategists do that all the time, like Eric Rice pointed out this morning, which I thought was terrific. So we started calling it the extended, we ca started calling them the extendedrealtor.org team, which was the name of the website, and they were just the realtor.org meetings. And I think it just made it much clearer to us what their role was and to them about how we perceive them. So really, content strategy is really an event strategy or a product strategy. And I showed this slide once before, and somebody said, well, no, it's not. Like a, a strategy exists beyond the content, but it doesn't. The way all of these things appears in any digital medium is with content. So content is not outside the thing, it is the thing. It is the product image, it is the, all the information and the promotions about that event. So it, it, they're one and the same. So this is the website for this. I looked at this on two different browsers to see, well maybe it's a Firefox problem. Their address or phone number was not listed any place. So I don't know if this is specifically a content strategy problem, but it's clearly a, a disconnect. And then so I clicked on the contact page and that's what I got, which was also equally blurry on my screen on two different browsers than it is on, on this screen. So I don't think that they created this with the user needs in mind at all. I just wanted to put that out there. So, and that's the kind of thing that happens when people who are creating the content don't push back or they don't know or they didn't ask the right questions. So um, often I hear the term content strategy used in a way that makes me very frustrated and very unhappy, which is in the content marketing world. And they really mean content marketing strategy, which is perfectly valid, but they shorten it because, excuse me, because that's too many words. So then they just call it the content strategy. But that's a campaign with a finite beginning and an end, and it's specifically for marketing things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a new way of working so that the people who are creating the product have a sense of how it's going to live on the website and how it's going to be promoted and what other things that organization is creating that are also about that topic or of interest to those same people so that it actually works in this holistic way. So there's a saying that I didn't create but I cannot for the life of me find out who did. It's from the early days of the web that the web drives organizational change and it's exactly uh, what we're talking about here. And it's communication and in a large organization that communication means introducing people to each other who are creating information about the same kind of topics that who don't even know each other. And it's getting people to work together. It's creating a shared awareness of the audience and right after this I'm going to tell you a story. And it's having a common sense of what the brand is. Who are we? What do we do? Who are we talking to? So to create order, content strategists often fall back on the things that we know how to do. So this is a tiny, tiny snippet of a 135,000 line content audit that I just finished for a huge university system in California. Um, so we analyze the content. We plan, this is, I just finished teaching uh, one of the first graduate level content strategy courses. And this was um, an editorial calendar that one of my students created. We set guidelines, and here's another student example. We used part of the website as our, our test case. Um, so we set guidelines, and then we write them all down. So this was what I spent my first about eight months at the National Association of Realtors creating. How do PDFs work? Who gets an online poll? How long are we gonna, what's the life cycle for different content types? The specific content strategy Bible. 
And once we were real, once we were done with the content part, we realized we needed a lot of other strategies. So there's the information manager's role, overall site strategy, design strategy, and some of these were blank because we sort of didn't get to them. But we spent, like I said, a lot of organizational time and money creating this. When we were done, we had something that was about this thick, it's our Bible, and we, w we had 23 different departments who created <coughs> content that went on the website, and we, we had meetings with each and every department that says, okay, going forward, here's how the website's gonna work. Here's how PDFs are gonna work. Here's the life cycle. Here's all the stuff. And it was covered in, in my copy, was covered in post-it notes, so I made sure to point out the right things to the right people. So, what do you think happened after each of those meetings? What did the, so we met with these departments, we walked them through, and what they do with it when the meeting was over? That's right. So really, in retrospect, I think that the audience for that document wasn't really them, it was us. Because they had no motivation other than, than the fact that we had this Bible to change the way they worked. So this was the giant realization. And <coughs> eventually, we put it up on, first of all, it was really hard to change because when we created this, it was early 2006, social media didn't exist. So obviously that's something that got added after not too long. So it had to be added or modified because we realized we didn't, we f didn't address this or this had to change or whatever. So what were we really gonna tell somebody replace page 32 in the document? They, nobody does that. So we put it online as a wiki so that anybody could see it and that helped a little and ultimately then we adopted a centralized production model. So instead of 90 people out of 300 staff who are publishing content, they all made requests and we did the publishing. And that happened both to um, help us enforce some of these rules, but also because our content management system crashed their computer. So it was sort of convenience. Um, but ultimately then too, um, they weren't learning to do their behavior differently or to, to, they weren't learning to behave differently. And so ultimately, I don't think that it was as successful as it should have been. And really check your job title at the door. So they had deep experience with the company, the, the organization, they'd been there 20 years or more, many of them. Um, and so they had a ton of exposure to our members, our audience, and they could tell us a lot about those. Bec because, and these people were among the naysayers. So this is me in the corner over here. Um, they were the people who said, yeah, but my committee wants, or yeah, but the members I talked to want. So it was that whole yeah, but thing. And this was our way to get them past their concerns and their automatic no in their own minds to a place where it's more collective and, uh, and developing uh, this shared understanding of who the audience is. So we thought about their motivations, their challenges, their stresses, what's keeping them up at night. And we, um, we ended up with these four personas and, and the consultant was really specific. It can't be 20, it can't be nine, maximum is four. And, and it actually took us 30 minutes as a group to come up with the four, which was surprising, uh, surprisingly fast. And even though we did this probably th four years ago, I can still tell you every detail about these people. You know, this was the hotshot new target audience segment. This was our demographic middle. This was a, the broker who could lead us to the individual real estate agents. And this was the person who worked at the association, also sort of a, a, a B2B, if you will. So then uh, we created life-size cutouts. So the, the reason that it was subversive is that, one, we got amazing information, but we got the staff to, s to come together rather than sitting in their own silo all the time. Um, so we created life-size cutouts and they sat outside of my office. So every time we were having a meeting, it was like, here are these people. And when we actually introduced them, I wrote a little script so we condensed all this information into a tiny thing and we had people introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Anthony, you know, I'm a new young broker, you gotta give me information fast. So really em embodying 
who these audience segments were, and it made conversations about who the audience is so much faster. Because then you can say, well, really? You want X, Y, and Z? Is that going to resonate with this new, mem new type of member who we said we were going to go after? And if it's not, sorry, it doesn't belong on the home page. And so all of these things are about empowering you to make good decisions. You, the content strategist, you, the website person, whatever, to make good decisions that are defendable. So in addition to the qualitative stuff, there's the quantitative stuff. And this is like my own learning mission is I need to get better at the quantitative stuff, which is Google Analytics, survey data, all of that to show what people are actually using. So remember I showed you the snippet of the giant content audit that I did? One of the things we did, and it took me forever to integrate the Google Analytics information with, with the pages. And even though page views aren't everything, it was a shocking statistic that 94% of the content that they gave me, and they knew a lot of it was outdated, 94% had zero views in the past year. So, and we interviewed 60 stakeholders as part of this project. And, um, and they said, well, we're a public institution. All of our information has to be online and people are using it. And I would say, really, how, how many? Well, I don't know, but I know people are using it and we should keep it out there. And there was one group of content in particular that, that I said, like, what is this? It was a whole bunch, 45 or something, course descriptions. Well, you're a university system. You're not an individual campus. Why do you have course descriptions on your website? And they, sa and they said, um, we spent a lot of time and money creating them. They need to stay online for seven more years. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And then they were, they, their content got, had two views. And I told this to the web manager. She said, yeah, you and me, probably, which is <laughs> true. So I think that policies and guidelines, plus audience understanding, plus business knowledge, which we haven't really talked about, but I assume that that's the part that content strategists already know is, what are we in business to do and why? So that equals your vision. So now once you have the vision, now you have to start and do pilot testing. And you do pilot testing of various initiatives with the people who've been bugging you hey, can't we do this? Hey, I really want to be an early adopter. Hey, you know, we want to be the ones to try out Pinterest. So you already know who they are in your organization. And those are the people you start the pilot efforts with. Let's try something different. Let's try these new things. Let's try a new policy. Let's see what happens if we publish this as web pages instead of PDFs. Is that, is that going to make a difference? And just like a child learning to walk, um, um, takes a step and falls, takes a step and falls, takes a step and falls. It's not going to work the first time, and that's okay. This is how you learn. So once you have the stories, <clears throat> now you can have that meeting with the CEO. Because now you have the foundation that you have, you have your vision, you have the understanding, you know who your audience is, and you've tried some stuff. So now you can say, I have a vision, and here's what it's going to take to get there. Here's what it, how people are going to have to collaborate who don't collaborate now. Here's what they need to do. And I was going to do role playing, and I just didn't think there was time, and I, there's not because I'm 15 minutes. So your vision is going to be, here's how we get more people. Here's how we make more money. Um, this is your agenda for the meeting. Show what's broken and why about the current way you do things. So this is your literal agenda for the meeting with your CEO. You have to be in this meeting. So in my organization, it would have taken me convincing the VP who was my boss, her convincing the senior VP who was her boss that this meeting needed to happen and that I needed to be there, but I needed to be there. Um, you show the solutions and the potential and what it's gonna take to get there. You talk about your pilots, and then the last two things are a real conversation. It's not just presenting to that person, but it's having a conversation. So you know what the roadblocks are. So in the world of associations, we had a new president every year. The president always had an initiative. So how are we supposed to fill up our plate with all the things that the organization wants and still make room for the roadblocks that's that where the person says, I, I want to totally take over the homepage with X, Y, and Z. Well, how does, how does this all mesh? And it's really that 
top level buy-in that needs to tell you so that you don't get the buy-in and then have it all blow up the, a week later. And then you find out from them, how do you want me to keep you up to date on this? What do you need to know and on wh with what kind of frequency? So um, one of the things that I think you need to do politically is this idea that sounds radical and it sounds like it's a contra contrary to everything we know about content strategy. But rather than just break down the silos, you have to start from a place of respect for your colleagues. They have 25 years of expertise in an area. And in order to get them to work in a different way, you have to respect what they bring to the table. So it's not nothing. And a lot of times, people talk about content strategy and break down the silos. And yes, they need to collaborate. But respect the good stuff that's in there. Be patient. This is a guy making a, a Tibetan monk making a, a mandala. And um, when he was over here, it didn't look like much. But then once you know he's at the end, it starts to really become something beautiful. But it takes a whole lot of patience to get there. And show them how. So you can't just say, hi, new way of working, see ya. You have to be in there, create the tutorials you need, show them how, give them lessons. We had meetings every quarter where we said, you know, we taught them about the importance of title tags, for example. Why are title tags important? When you create it like this, it looks like this in Google. And they don't know that. They're not web people, so they don't understand the implications of the choices that they make every day and the reasons that you picked whatever policies. What does that say? How many minutes? Two. Oops. Okay. So meet right, I just said that, blah, blah, blah. Report on successes. So show them what is doing well. So to foster collaboration, um, here are my thoughts on that. Form a cross-departmental de editorial board and have not only you be the person saying no, but you a collective group of manager level people from different departments who evaluate major requests. Um, most impactful stories require information from multiple sources. So for this university system, the most impactful stories they have are the impact that the system has on the state. Well, that's not one department. That's like information that lives right now in six different places from six different departments. Those people need to work together to have it work. And then you have to motivate and recognize. And this is here because people aren't going to act differently just because you tell them. Ultimately, their performance review has to change, what they're measured on, what they are based on, all of that. So you have to help from your end, which is tout the successes and share them with the group of people who publish information and with the CEO. So motivate and recognize that way. But ultimately, HR, human resources, needs to get involved so that they have a reason. And so it's the carrot and the stick all the time. So it might be on your intranet at regular blah, 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 so I said that already. Redefine success. So everybody says success is <coughs> big check mark. It's on the website. But it's not. Now they're, they're not done anymore. And so just putting it up there isn't really sufficient. Um, and this was a, another amazing quote from Confab this past year. Yes, page views are a start, but they're not the goal. Page views are a step toward having the content do what it's supposed to do, which is drive more attendance at the event or <clears throat> get more people to buy the product. If one person looked at the page and two people bought the product, it's still a winning. <coughs> and then educate and remind. So here's another um, quote from a friend of mine called strategic nagging, not a quote, but a, a philosophy, which is repetition of the patient repetition of the same message over and over again. So this is a, a, an agenda from one of our quarterly meetings that we had. So here were going to be our turnaround times because so we, we were establishing all of these policies, <coughs> best practices for using PDFs and PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera. So then you want to put the, build it into the way people work. So setting an expiration date in your content management system so that content will be expired or renewed. So it's not just because we said so, but it's in there. <clears throat> and offer options so they can be creative, right? So that there's a, this idea of like a content toolbox. 
so that you're giving them choices, but they're, they're pre-approved choices, right? So it's sort of like a kid. When you, when you have a toddler, you don't say, what do you want to drink for breakfast? Because Coca-Cola, not an option. You say, do you want milk or orange juice? And so this way, people get to be creative because you've created a whole bunch of modules that they can choose from. So you win and they win. And this is the life-size cutouts that we introduced. Then be there for them. H have Q&As. Listen to their concerns. Help them convince their management if they need to. And build your content strategy army. Don't look at this. Um, which is make those champions. So everybody who has a pilot and who has, who has done something that works, when you have a next question, refer it to those people so that they're helping they're sort of paying it forward and helping their colleagues do the right thing. Eventually, you'll have to say no. So this was a Jewish mother. Look, if it were up to me, I would be OK. But now you point to the policy. So you have something to point to that says, no, this isn't because I feel like it. We have this approved policy, and this is how we work. So here's an example of one of those policies about the content strategy for our homepage. Here's what goes on. Oh, sorry, doesn't want to, doesn't meet one of those. I wish it could go on the homepage, but it really can't. But then you report on successes to the CEO, and then you win. So here's the order again. And I think that's it. Yep, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>